Uh, everybody, thank you for joining us in our Healthier Aging Embracing Change presentation. If you are interested in learning more about being a, a, a member, volunteer, donor, or Ashby Village enthusiast, enthusiast, please come join us on our Tuesday, August 3rd, living room chat from two to three, it's a Zoom, and the information is in your chat box. Finally, although these events are free for all to attend, Ashby Village does rely on donations from our community to bring programs such as this to our members and our friends. And once again, I want to bring your attention to the chat box um, so where Sue Yin has placed a, a link for a simple way you can make a tax deductible donation at your leisure. And you can also go to our website anytime and we thank you for your support. I would now, I would, with, with, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's Kaiser Permanente Ashby Village Partnership presenter, Solomon Young. Solomon Young is a registered dietitian nutritionist who completed his bachelor's in science in nutrition from the University of California in Davis. And he completed his dietetic internship and master's in nutrition at Central Washington University. He has worked as a dietitian for the past 10 years in many different settings, including hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, home health, and teaching at community college level. He has been with Kaiser Permanente for the past seven years and currently works as a dietitian in, in Kaiser Permanente's East, home, East Bay Home Health Department. And take it away, Solomon. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hope you are doing well today. Uh, this is my very first Zoom meeting I've ever done. Uh, so this is definitely new to me. Um, before I kind of start my presentation, I do want to uh, make sure to uh, advise that if you plan to make any changes to your diet or add to start any kind of supplements, it's always best to ask your primary care physician before you make any changes. So without further ado, let me uh, pull up my presentation here. Give me one second. Let's see. We should show up. Let's see. All right. There we go. Does it show up for everyone? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. Just want to make sure. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Jeanette mentioned, uh, I'm a registered dietitian with the Kaiser Permanente Home Health Department in the East Bay area. Um, I have not visited Ashby Village, uh, but I've, I believe I've passed through um, uh, at least areas where uh, in the Berkeley area. So uh, anyways, uh, so before we kind of talk about nutrition and supplementation, uh, I did want to talk, about, uh, you know, go through some very, um, some quotes here. Just give me one second while I move. One of these windows. Let's see. Okay. There. Um, yeah. So I wanted to start off our my presentation with some some quotes um, from some famous, very famous people. Uh, the doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but rather will cure and prevent disease with nutrition. Uh, this is, of course, from Thomas Edison, uh, America's uh, well-known inventor. Uh, another important quote, good nutrition will prevent 95% of all disease uh, from Linus Pauling, who was a famous uh, chemist who actually won two Nobel prizes, one in chemistry and one for the Nobel Peace Prize. So very, very smart people here. We also have uh, Hippocrates, who is a Greek physician, but a famous quote by him, let food be thy medicine. Uh, and the last quote here is uh, one that is from an anonymous source, but there are many ways to love your body, but feeling your body with nutritious food is the highest form of self-respect. I really like this quote because essentially it's saying uh, your body, to respect it, you have to put good things in it. So nutrition is, is one of those things. I feel like we can't talk about supplements without talking about nutrition. So the objectives for today uh, I'm going to discuss the importance of nutrition and, of course, identify what makes uh, a healthy diet. Uh, we'll talk about dietary supplements, so whether it's vitamins or minerals and herbs. My emphasis, of course, today is mostly on vitamins and minerals, just because there are so many herbs throughout the world, it's, it's hard to know uh, everything. Uh, we'll learn about the supplements, uh, whether they're necessary, and identify how it can be safe, but we'll also talk about how it can be harmful uh, you know, if it's taken incorrectly or in combination with drugs. And of course, we'll have time 
to do a Q&A. So if you have any questions, hopefully I can uh, uh, answer them. So why is good nutrition important? So we know nutrition is, a corner, is one of the more important things to, to live a, a healthy life. But nutrition provides your body with the energy you need for your everyday, for your everyday life, whether it's your physical activity, whether it's dancing, even just living, right? We need, we need sustenance in order to live. Good nutrition is important to help maintain a healthy weight. So whether you're overweight, underweight, normal weight, uh, we, we definitely want to make sure that we are we have good nutrition to to maintain a uh, healthy weight. In my in my work, I oftentimes deal with people that are under nutrition. Uh, oftentimes, when you have cancer or different diseases, uh, you can imagine we lose weight, and that puts us at risk. So uh, sometimes in a hospital or in the home health setting, I'm talking to people about how we can improve their nutrition, uh, and and hopefully help them regain weight that they've lost as a result of their disease process. Uh, good nutrition is important to reduce uh, the onset of disease. So if you have, for example, a heart disease, if it runs in your family or diabetes and whatnot. So those, those of course, we want to try to reduce the onset of that. Uh, recovery, uh, very important. When you're in the hospital, good nutrition is actually gonna help you recover faster and shorten your hospitalization stay. Uh, recover, nutrition is also important for recovery, not just from surgery, but also from exercise. So for those of you who have ran marathons or done any kind of physical uh, strenuous activity, uh, you can imagine if you were to have poor nutrition afterwards, it would take you a longer time to recover. Uh, and of course, uh, management of and treatment of your current health. So for a lot of uh, older individuals that might have diabetes or heart disease, you have to watch what you eat. So whether it's watching out the salts or the cholesterol or the carbohydrates and sugar, you can imagine good nutrition is important to, to help manage those. And of course, living long and prosperous. So here I have a picture of uh, Leonard Nimoy who played the uh, famous character Spock uh, on Star Trek. A uh, famous quote that he always says is to live long and prosper. Uh, so hence why good nutrition is important. So what does a general healthy diet look like? Um, so a general healthy diet for most individuals is having a variety of a lot of plant-based foods, uh, meaning fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes. Uh, protein sources can come from both animal and plant-based sources. The more recent trends, though, have been focusing and leaning a shift on more plant-based sources of protein, uh, whether it's like beans or whole grains, uh, you know, nuts, legumes, seeds, so using more plant-based sources. And to minimize the amount of saturated trans fat and cholesterol. The saturated trans fat and cholesterol we know are associated with uh, you know, heart disease, uh, higher, higher incidences of cardiovascular diseases, you know, things like stroke and whatnot. Uh, and most of these foods we know come from animal sources. So whether it's your red meat, your bacon, your butter, all those types of foods. Um, not to say that you can't eat healthy from animal sources, um, but a lot of the uh, saturated trans fat and cholesterol come from those animal sources. Uh, as far as fats, we wanna make sure it's coming from plant-based sources. So olive oil, avocados, nuts, to name a few. Uh, and of course, trying to minimize the pro processed foods and added sweets that we eat and that we have in our diet. So minimizing those would mean not eating your ice cream every night, or having uh, your bacon uh, every day or your TV dinners. Um, so those are what are processed foods. And of course, maintaining adequate hydration. Uh, so for most people, six to eight cups of, of fluid or water uh, is adequate. Of course, nutrition is very individualized. So um, as I put here on the bottom, a disclaimer. So your optimal diet may depend on your health condition your physical activity level, any food allergies you might have, any intolerances, any religious beliefs or personal beliefs. Uh, so definitely please consult with your doctor or a dietitian uh, if you have questions on what diet you should, to, you, you should be following. So what's the best diet for me? Uh, this is a very general question. And of course, this is for the general population. 
Um, but according to the US News and World Report's annual list, the Mediterranean diet has actually been ranked the number one uh, diet over the past four years. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Mediterranean diet, it's basically the diet that's mostly consumed around the countries near the Mediterranean Sea, as you can see on the map on the top right. Uh, the diet emphasizes olives, olive oils, legumes, uh, un unrefined cereals, grains, fruit, and vegetables. So very plant-based uh, emphasis. When it comes to proteins uh, and animal sources, it emphasizes the consumption of fish, um, some, some dairy products, and of course, uh, occasional wine, so moderate consumption, and low consumption of non-fish meat products. So that would be things like uh, red meat, um, you know, chicken and whatnot, so to not consume it as much, but more emphasis on the, on the, whole, the whole foods. Uh, nutrition is very individualized. So depending on your health condition, as I mentioned earlier, you may need to follow certain restrictions. So for example, if you're if you have heart disease, you might want to stay away from the more of the processed foods. So if you're diabetic, maybe not have as much of those carbohydrates. So, um, so with a Mediterranean diet, you can still have it individualized to cater to your, your nutrition needs. Um, and, on, and lastly, I did want to mention about fad diets. So fad diets are basically uh, diets that kind of come and go, basically what trends, right? What's trending? Uh, you've, I'm sure if some of you have heard of the Atkins diet or the uh, paleo diet or raw food diet, liquid diet. These are, these are diets that kind of come and go, um, but they are fads because they don't stick. Uh, with any sort of nutrition, uh, any sort of diet, you definitely want to make sure that it's sustainable from the long, for long term, meaning you could follow it for, for the rest of your life. And hence why Mediterranean diet is a diet that can be followed and can provide you uh, with help. So what should I do if I can't follow a diet? How can I improve? And what about supplements? So for most people making uh, large changes to their diet, it's really difficult, right? Uh, for a lot of us, we grew up eating a certain way, uh, whether it's meat and potatoes or for a lot of Asian cultures, maybe eating rice, for Hispanic culture, maybe tortillas or uh, what not. Um, so it, for some people, it's hard to make drastic changes uh, for those reasons. There's also cultural changes. So for a lot of people who came to the United States uh, or, or emigrated to another country to make uh, changes to your diet is, is dif dif difficult. My parents came from uh, China or Hong Kong back in the 1970s. And so I'm sure when they came here, it was a big change for them in order to try to adapt and adjust. Uh, and of course, food preferences. For a lot of people that are, uh, it's, it's hard to make changes to their diet, especially if they're very particular with it, what they like. Uh, I know my mom is very, very uh, a picky eater. So for her to, to make some, some small changes can be hard, but of course, I think if you keep trying, uh, hopefully uh, we'll find ways to make food better. Sorry about that. Um, so what, what can you do to improve your diet? What I recommend to a lot of my patients is to make subtle changes because making small subtle changes are easier. The goal is to make small changes over time rather than a big drastic change all in one day. So for example, changing from drinking whole milk to 1%, at least you're reducing the amount of uh, saturated fat and cholesterol you're consuming, or maybe changing from eating chicken thighs to chicken breasts without the skin, or maybe incorporating more vegetables and fruit into your diet. Um, so making small changes is a good way to improve your nutrition. Food is the natural way of, of improving uh, your, not only just vitamins and minerals, uh, but also the uh, antioxidants that they contain. Um, but what, what do we do when we can't make those changes? For a lot of people, uh, they believe that supplementing your diet is an is a easy way to improve your nutrition, as well as your health, your stamina, stamina, reduce stress, reduce inflammation, so on and so forth. Supplements can definitely have a potential benefit, but I will say that it can also not give you any sort of benefit or it could potentially cause you harm. And I'll talk about um, why that is. Um, I want to also make sure to mention that supplements are heavily promoted 
and marketed and advertised. I'm sure a lot of you have uh, seen a lot of uh, infomercials or have a magazine where they're uh, selling some sort of supplements or, or uh, billboards and ads. Um, and the reason why supplements are heavily promoted is because it's a big industry. And I'll kind of talk about some numbers uh, regarding that. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of supplements will also have a FD, FDA exclaimer on the supplements, which states, these supplements have not been evaluate, evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Oftentimes, people don't really even see this or notice it and just take the supplement thinking that it's going to help improve their condition or cure them. So I do want to make sure that uh, everyone is aware that the FDA actually does not regulate supplements. And I'll talk more about FDA regulation in the upcoming slides. So what are dietary supplements? So by definition, a dietary supplement is a vitamin, mineral, herb, or botanical, or it could be an amino acid uh, that's meant to supplement the diet by increasing the total dietary intake. Or it could also be a concentrate, a metabolite, constituent, extract, or combination of the preceding substances. Subst subs supplements can be extracted from food sources, or they can be made synthetically in order to increase the quantity of their consumption, meaning it could be made in a lab. Uh, in the picture you have uh, that you'll see on the slide, I have some cranberries, right, uh, which, which are delicious. They go great with a salad or it could be eaten raw, uh, but th they can be extracted and basically created into a pill form. Uh, so you'll see here cranberry capsules or cran cranberry tablets, which are commonly used uh, to help people that, have, that are susceptible to urinary tract infections. So dietary supplements come in many different forms. The most common form, of course, being pills, but they can come in powders, liquids, beverages, extracts, um, nutritional drinks, uh, for example, like uh, Boost or Insure or Orgain, uh, technically are, are in a nutrition supplement that have dietary supplement uh, components to it, oftentimes fortified with vitamins and minerals. Approximately two thirds of Americans take some form of dietary supplement. I can't see all the number of viewers, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost certain a lot of you are nodding your head that yeah, I do take some sort of dietary supplement. Um, dietary supplements, as I mentioned earlier, it's definitely a very big business. Uh, there's a huge co consumer industry. So you can see some figures here. In 2020, the US market alone, dietary supplements made up of made up 400, uh, sorry, not 400, 46 billion US dollars. In 2020, which was just last year, the global market was 140.1 billion US dollars. And I had to type it all out so you could see all the zeros of how, how much money is involved. And we anticipate that it'll, it'll continue to grow because it is a big industry. Dietary supplements, as I mentioned, are heavily marketed and oftentimes will have health claims. Uh, so in this example, you see that a health claim would be something like, uh, you know, on the label, it might say it boosts the immune system, might support the breast, prostate, cardiovascular, vision, skin, colon health, uh, et cetera. You'll also notice that it has a little uh, star, uh, star next to these claims. And that kind of goes back to the FDA claim um, of, uh, that we saw earlier, uh, right? basically on the bottom right here, saying that these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, and this product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So you can imagine when you pick up a bottle and you see that, it makes you think, oh, wow, I should be taking this. Um, but of course, uh, once again, it's, it's not regulated. And that's where it's important for you as a consumer to educate yourself. And I'll talk more about that as well. So dietary supplements do not go undergo any government testing before it's marketed. And the safety of these supplements are uh, definitely relied heavily on the manufacturer or company that produces them, or they can be, uh, you can also rely on third party companies to verify the safety of them. 
So prior to 1994, supplements were less regulated. In 1994, um, basically what's called the, the Shea Act or the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, um, that allowed the FDA, the Food Drug Administration, the ability to remove products from the market only after, after the marketed products are shown to either be adulter adulterated or misbranded. Uh, meaning if it became contaminated or let's say the active ingredient was a lot more than it uh, was intended to be, that's when the FDA can uh, regulate and come in and, and basically find these companies or have the products removed. And I have an example of that in a later slide as well. So dietary supplements, do we need them? Right. This is the big question I'm sure you're all wondering. Do we actually, in fact, need to supplement our diets? Um, and of course, it's a very case-by-case -case situation. Um, but I will say most people actually do not need to take any form of dietary supplement, especially if their diet has a wide variety of plant-based foods. So grains, fruits, vegetables, legume seeds, which I mentioned earlier. Supplements can potentially provide a benefit but it can also cause harm, especially when it's combined with other supplements or medications or when it's consumed in excessive dose. You know, anything, uh, too much of anything is bad for you, even water. Um, so that's where being careful with taking the amount, uh, the dosing is very, very important. How do I know whether something is safe or not? So that's where, once again, emphasis on talking to your healthcare team. That way, you know, you want to find people that are knowledgeable about, um, you know, science, about health to, to help you determine whether something is safe or not. Not only that, but if your chances are if you're taking medications, uh, you know, your doctor or pharmacist may be familiar with certain supplements having an interaction with those uh, certain medications. Um, and it's also important for you to do your own research about supplements. Uh, and when I mean doing your own research, I'm talking about looking at scientific articles or uh, researching from credible sources, not just the news, not just friends, not just social media or commercials, but to really look at, um, to, to really investigate and learn more about them. On the bottom right uh, on my slide, you'll see uh, what's called the scientific method. So for anyone who's had to take uh, any science classes, uh, scientific method is basically when you're uh, research is something, you come up with a hypothesis, you test the experiment, you analyze the data, you conclude, and it's a, it's a continuous cycle. That's why it's hard for us to, to really know the answer to something because we are constantly learning about, we're finding new things and testing different uh, hypotheses. Uh, but this is how, you, you know, how a lot of scientists determine their findings is through doing this process. So when are dietary supplements appropriate? So in, in a uh, clinical setting, if you are deficient, which is usually checked by your healthcare provider, that's when supplementation can be necessary. Um, some of the most common deficiencies in the US, uh, I would say is iron deficiency and vitamin D deficiency. So I'm almost certain that some of my, our participants uh, today, here today are probably taking one uh, or either or both uh, potentially, right? So if you're anemic, uh, normally you might be prescribed uh, iron to help uh, with the anemia. Uh, if you're vitamin D deficient, meaning uh, you're probably not consuming a lot in your diet, uh, then uh, chances are your doctor probably had prescribed you some sort of vitamin D. Um, so some other uh, times when dietary supplements are appropriate is if you're following a very restrictive diet whether it's medical necessity or religious practice or personal beliefs. So medical necessity, uh, a common example would be maybe if you were, um, if you've had gastric bypass or gastric surgery, meaning uh, whether it was uh, planned or maybe secondary to cancer, um, chances are you might not be able to eat as much or get as much nutrients as you've needed or absorb as much nutrients. So your doctor may be may prescribe you uh, vitamins and minerals to make up for the fact that you're not eating as much. Uh, religious practices, uh, that's, that might be something like uh, if you're avoiding uh, 
you know, meat for whatever reason, uh, or or fasting, or um, or like for example, Ramadan, uh, where you're not eating basically when the sun is uh, sun is up. Uh, you're only eating, um, you know, when the sun is, you know, when the sun is down before the sun rises and uh, after the sun uh, sets. Uh, personal beliefs is more so for people that might follow uh, vegetarianism or veganism uh, for personal reasons. Uh, and so sometimes uh, with those specific diets, uh, you may need to supplement your diet with some additional things. For example, like uh, vitamin B12 uh, for people that tend to follow a vegan diet. Supplements are also um, uh, appropriate when it's used in conjunction with medication to help treat medical conditions. So for example, anemia, osteoporosis, I mentioned gastric surgery, alcoholism, severe diarrhea, vomiting, dehydration. Um, so, you know, for example, dehydration, diarrhea and vomiting, oftentimes uh, you may be treated with, supplemented with uh, sodium or potassium or chloride to, to help make sure you're not uh, deficient. Um, some supplements are actually used to treat symptoms too. So for anyone who has, uh, you know, reflux or gastric reflux, you might be taking a Tums, which is calcium carbonate. If you're constipated, you might take some sort of magnesium. So milk of magnesia uh, or magnesium oxide oftentimes will be used to help treat constipation. Uh, senna or senna leaf, which is a really common uh, laxative, is oftentimes used to treat uh, constipation as well. Um, another common supplement that a lot of uh, I, a lot of our patients, uh, older patients, will be taking is uh, melatonin just to help regulate their sleep. Uh, so definitely, supplements can be useful in in helping treating specific conditions. Supplements can also help the side effects of certain medications. So for anyone taking Lasix, which is uh, furosemide or any sort of diuretic. Oftentimes, they may, might be taking additional potassium in the form of potassium chloride. And of course, there's also herbal supplements uh, and extracts. Um, so those would be things like uh, turmeric uh, or cranberry tablets, uh, whatnot. And so a lot of, a lot of these can, be, can provide a potential benefit. Um, but of course, once again, I uh, strongly advise you consult with your physician. Uh, before deciding to take any of these uh, types of herbal supplements. So why can supplements be harmful? So I mentioned earlier that they're not tightly regulated um, as, as one reason, but supplements can also have drug interactions as well. So I, I have a few examples here of, of vitamin and drug interactions. So vitamin K, which is uh, which you can get in pill form, but normally comes from a lot of leafy green vegetables. Uh, it can have an effect with Coumadin, which is a, a blood thinner. Uh, grapefruit or grapefruit juice uh, can have an interaction with uh, statin drugs. So statin drugs are basically uh, things like Lipitor, Simvastatin, Lovastatin. Those are used to help lower your cholesterol. So you can imagine if you're taking that medication and you're taking some um, additional supplements that might interact with it, then, then that might make the uh, drug no longer useful in helping reduce your cholesterol. Uh, calcium and uh, doxycycline. Doxycycline is a type of antibiotic. So certain antibiotics, which can be used to treat um, you know, infections, uh, if you're taking certain supplements, it can interact with the, with the drug and make, basically make it uh, no longer effective and decrease its, its effectiveness. So it's important to know that Dietary supplements can interact with any kind of medications that you're taking. Um, they can also be harmful because you have to remember what goes in must come out. So what I mean by that is when you take a supplement, we digest it, we metabolize it, but oftentimes it has to leave our body somehow. Uh, oftentimes it's through urine, right? We pee it out or maybe we poop it out. Uh, and so it has to leave our body. But because we put it in and it has to come out, sometimes it will, uh, because of that, it definitely increases the work, workload on our kidneys, could work, increase the workload on our liver. Um, so you can imagine it's, you know, it, it has its, uh, it's not just all fun and games. It, it can definitely uh, cause issues as well, especially if you have uh, uh, certain conditions.
Uh, dietary supplements, as I mentioned, do not go any testing before it's marketed. Uh, and a lot of times companies may produce low quality products, which can oftentimes contain impurities and contaminants and toxins. Um, you don't hear about it in the news a whole lot, but sometimes, um, you know, company, you know, the government has to regulate and they, they oftentimes actually find a lot of companies because of the impurities they find in these supplements. Um, so in this slide, I actually have a picture. Let's see if this link will work. Hopefully it should open up another window. Uh, yes. Let's see. Let me see here. Hopefully, hopefully the screen, sh uh, the link showed up. And if it didn't, I do apologize. But basically, the link was to show um, was linked to this uh, major league baseball player. His name is Steve uh, Bechler. He basically was taking a dietary supplement, I believe, called Hydroxy Cut, which contained the active ingredient called ephedra. Uh, well, as a result of that, he actually ended up dying, uh, I think during uh, training, uh, he, had, he suffered from a heat stroke. And so when they did an autopsy, uh, they found that he was taking ephedra and they found it in his system, um, but they believe that that probably led to his death. And he was relatively young, I think 20, yeah, 23 years of age. Um, sadly enough though, uh, this company, they ended up uh, basically reformulating their supplements to no longer contain ephedra, uh, and it's still marketed today, uh, just without the ephedra component. Basically, after this happened, after he died, the FDA came in and, and basically told, not only find the company, but basically told them they can't, can't be sell, uh, selling um, their, their uh, original product formulation. So when it comes to dietary supplements, uh, what should you buy? How do I know something is safe? So I'm assuming that your healthcare provider approved your uh, approved or suggested you take certain supplements. Here are my recommendations. You want to choose well-known brands and labels. The reason why is these big companies, they oftentimes have higher quality control and are usually more stricter with testing. You can imagine if they were to mess up, not only did they mess up, uh, they messed up on a very big scale. And so that could mean uh, a, a very big potential loss of revenue. Uh, you can also look for um, different seals, uh, USP verified seal. So in this example, you see USP uh, and some other examples here on the bottom right too, NSF, which is a, a National Safety Foundation or a CL on this bottom right. Uh, with consumer labs, but these are independent uh, third-party companies that verify the standards of quality, purity, potency uh, of, of the supplement. Uh, so these are oftentimes uh, useful in helping you identify supplements that are safe because a third party did, did look into testing it. Um, and then I uh, make sure you know at least a few people are taking it. Just let them, let them be the guinea pig. No, I'm just kidding here. But chances are, if it's been around for a while, then it's a relatively safe uh, supplement, right? Um, at least having a history kind of proves that it's, it's safe and not, not going to cause you harm. So vitamins and minerals, what do we need as older adults? And what are sources of, the, of them? So hopefully the, the link will work or shows up. Uh, if not, you can definitely, uh, you know, check out the link later on. Uh, but essentially, this website goes to the National Institute of Aging, and it talks about the different vitamins and minerals that our body needs. Um, and of course, they also emphasize that it's usually better to get your nutrients from food rather than a pill. And the reason for that is, is, you know, food oftentimes not only contains a lot of nutrients in the form of vitamins and minerals, but it also contains a lot of things that we can't harvest into a, vitamin, into a pill form. So certain phytonutrients or antioxidants. Uh, there's also the benefit of fiber, um, right? Uh, which is found in food. If you, if you take a supplement, assuming it's not a fiber supplement, like a, a, a herbal supplement, you're not gonna get the benefit of the additional fiber, which is shown to be important for your gastrointestinal health, as well as your cardiovascular health. Uh, so that's why it's, it's better to get your, your nutrients from food as opposed to supplementation. 
So in summary, it's definitely the best way to stay healthy is to eat a well-balanced diet and to follow a healthy lifestyle. Supplements can be beneficial if you are deficient or at risk of being deficient um, or have a medical need for it, which is why it's important to talk with your doctor and communicate any changes to your diet. Herbal supplements can have, could potentially have a benefit, but could also potentially cause harm, especially when it's taken in excessive doses or when it's combined with certain foods or medications. So that kind of goes back to the example of that uh, major league baseball player who unfortunately, uh, you know, died from taking a, a supplement that probably shouldn't have been uh, put out in the consumer market. So if you plan to take any sort of supplements, what I recommend is looking for uh, well-known brands and looking for uh, some sort of seal of uh, verification, a third par party seal to uh, at least tell you that it's been tested and make sure that it's pure and, and doesn't contain any other contaminants uh, and, and whatnot. So that concludes my presentation. I'm sure there are, are gonna be questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and give this back to, I guess, yeah, to maybe me. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Solomon. Um, Actually, let me just uh, start with one question that came up uh, quite a bit now. Sure. So um, you actually recommended that, I mean, you should check in with your primary care physician, but it seems that is the problem, you know, because here are comments. Primary care doctors know so little about nutrition. And another one was, I mean, the doctors always want to know what we are taking, but never comment the comment on whether we should be taking it, you know, and then, I mean, and then there's a really a little bit more extensive comment and it says, I've been in Kaiser almost my entire life and I give my list of supplements to every doctor and ask them to tell me if uh, any are contraindicated with the medications they prescribe and so on and so on. And they always say, and answering respond by basically brushing me off, you know, and um, I don't recommend any herbs, spices and won't comment, won't comment and so on. And I think that seems to be a little bit the theme here that mm -hmm. primary care phys physicians yeah. in general don't really know so much yeah. about that, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I, these are excellent questions and definitely concerns. Um, I can speak a little bit about, I'm not a physician, right? I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, but uh, I have friends that are, uh, one of my college friends is a pediatric surgeon, but I remember talking with her and she was telling me the amount of schooling that the, you know, physicians have, it, it's crazy, right? It, you know, they learn, they have to learn so much in a shorter period of time. So I, I do agree with, uh, I do agree with some of these comments. Doctor, a lot of a lot of doctors, I'm not saying all, but a lot of doctors may not be aware of uh, vitamins or, or supplements. Supplements, of course, can be vitamins, could be minerals, could be herbs, it could, like I mentioned, could be constituents from uh, derived products from foods. So it's definitely hard for them to, to know anything and everything. However, I think it's important uh, like for them to know uh, because they, they do know medicine, right? In the form of medication. So, you know, if, if say you mention a certain uh, herbal supplement you might be taking, that might throw a red flag to them that, oh, wow, okay, this one we, for sure I know because, you know, I know, I know the medication, uh, you know, to have a, a uh, inter interaction with it, which can potentially cause, cause harm. Uh, so, for example, for example, turmeric, right, is a very, very common one, uh, more so in the more recent years, uh, medication that a lot of people take for, in, uh, an, you know, anti-inflammation. Uh, but turmeric can also actually thin the blood. So if you're taking turmeric and you're taking blood thinners, uh, you know, excessively, then that can, that can cause some potential, uh, potential harm. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I, I understand definitely there is a uh, concern you know, regarding uh, physicians. Um, but I, th I think ir irregardless, that's where, uh, you know, as a consumer, not only talking to your healthcare team, uh, but also doing your, your, um, your own research. Uh, and I did see the comment from one of the, uh, you know, from the one of the viewers, how they can, they subscribe to consumerlab.com, which is, which is great, right. To, to stay informed. Cause I think oftentimes we, we as individuals aren't informed with 
uh, you know, with, with everything. And so I think the more people that we can rely on uh, to help with that, the, the better. Yeah, that one uh, actually comment ended her comment with saying, I subscribe to consumerlab.com to get my answers on my own. So um, I don't know. I mean, that if that is um, a respectable uh, source, or I don't know if you know that one or if Yeah, you... yeah, that, that was one of the, um, yeah. uh, one of the uh, companies, third party companies that, that, that you... pretty much okay. you know, evaluate, make sure, you know, make sure that there aren't con kind of contaminants. You know. Right. Then there was one question about safety. Um, um, okay, I understand about safety, but what about finding brands that are most effective? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so that kind of, uh, I wouldn't say there are brands, well, uh, brands that are necessarily effective. You know, usually when you look at supplements, you're looking at the potency and that it contains what it's supposed to contain. Um, but that kind of just goes back to, you know, as far as the safety and effectiveness is, is mostly to look at uh, large, larger brands, right? Because as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, you want to choose a company that's been around for a while, who uh, that obviously has a lot more money to do more, to have more regulation and, you know, testing of these supplements so that they're safe for the consumer. And of course, looking for those third party uh, companies to make sure that it it is what it is. Yeah, um, yeah. Julie actually added to the consumer consumerlab.com site that they also quote clinical trials. So um, yeah, yeah. Being helpful too. Yeah. Yeah. So clinical trials are definitely uh, you know that's kind of goes back to what I was mentioning the scientific process, right? When you're doing kind of research, you want to look for scientific uh, studies, right? Where they basically gave a supplement to. Uh, you know, a placebo group versus a, a, a group that actually received it, you know, ideally you want to look at a scientific study that what they call is double blinded, placebo controlled. Uh, double blinded basically means the, um, the person receiving the supplement doesn't know that they're receiving it. And even the scientist who's doing the study doesn't know uh, who's getting what. That way it's the strongest, um, so strongest way to, to evaluate the study. Because once you uh, once you get the results from the study, uh, what they basically run is a st statistical analysis to see if there was a benefit from that supplement to compare it to the placebo group, and that's how they can determine what they call sig uh, statistical significance to come to a conclusion. So there is a question about turmeric. You already mentioned turmeric before, but um, it says here, is it actually valuable and why? And um, do you have a recommendation about how much to take? So um. yeah, uh, turmeric is definitely one of those uh, trending types of supplements. I personally uh, will use it in cooking, uh, but I don't take a supplement uh, in a supplement form. Um, I also heard from cases from uh, my colleagues as well uh, regarding people that did take turmeric uh, incorrectly, took too many doses and actually ended up dying. Uh, not, not specifically from turmeric, uh, but uh, this, uh, this person or patient, they had a basically a brain bleed, a traumatic brain injury. And because they were taking such a high dose of turmeric, they're uh, basically, they just pretty much kept on bleeding and which, which eventually led to the de their death. Um, I think they were also taking some blood thinners as well. So that kind of goes back to what I was talking about, how you don't want to be taking, um, you know, med medications or supplements in high doses, especially if you're taking medications, and especially if you haven't talked to uh, someone, you know, your doctor or pharmacist or dietitian or your healthcare team. Um, but to kind of go back to the question, um, there, there isn't a specific dose I recommend. Um, but rather, if you want to include that into your, uh, if you want to reap the benefits of turmeric, try incorporating into your diet, right? Turmeric is a common uh, root. Uh, I think it's a, it's similar to ginger, right? So it's used a lot in a lot of Asian cooking or Southeast Asian cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, they sell, I believe they sell turmeric powder at Costco too. So you can always sprinkle it and add it to food. That's a, a lot better way to, to definitely get it. Yeah, get the nutrients and the, the benefits of it. 
Thank you. So then next question is actually also kind of interesting because it, um, yeah, it, it says CVS, you know, vitamin D has no outside verification la label. How do I check if it has been tested and verified? And I think that is concerns other. Sure. Uh, yeah. Know, I mean, well. I'm not, I'm not saying that if it's not, if it doesn't have the USP seal, it doesn't mean it's not, uh, it doesn't have the correct dosing, but if you wanted to be extra careful, of course, then, then, you know, USP seal uh, to have that or the consumer lab seal uh, would, would be ideal. Um, but I, I would say a lot of vitamins and minerals, chances are like, for example, like for CVS, their brand or, or Walmart, I'm, I'm pretty certain that they're probably not going to be too, um, uh, the, 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 the content and potency is probably gonna be, it should be accurate. Um, but if you want, you know, everyone's different, right? As far as their, uh, their comfort level. So if you if you definitely want to switch to something that has a USP seal, then that would be something you can do. Um, I think I was, I saw in the past, maybe four or five years ago, there are some, uh, some companies that uh, falsely put the USP seal on their, on, on their supplements as well. Uh, which is uh, obviously a big no-no and they were fined and, 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 and whatnot. So I'm not saying, uh, it, it's one of those things, you just have to do your research. It, it's, it's, such a, uh, it's such a big industry that a lot of people do shady practices, unfortunately. So I think trying to rely more so on your healthcare team, uh, you know, the third party uh, companies to evaluate, it would probably be the safest bet. Um, but for vitamins and minerals, if you're buying something that doesn't have a USP seal, I, I would say chances are it should be fine. Hmm. Well, there is a question about melatonin. I think that's an interesting question because I think a lot of people take melatonin actually mm -hmm. for sleeping. So it says here, I was told to take melatonin because I have a, I have a difficult time sleeping. However, I was recently informed that one should not take melatonin on a long-term basis. It is so hard to know what to do if you are receiving contradictory information. And I think yeah. that's a really good question because yeah. not only concerns melatonin. No, that, no, that's an excellent question. So melatonin, our body actually produces naturally. Uh, you know, when, when it starts to get dark or when we start to close our eyes, uh, our body does produce uh, melatonin. Um, and so for, for a lot of people uh, that have trouble sleeping, sometimes the reason why you might have trouble sleeping is because your body's not producing enough of it, or maybe there's too much stimulation, right? I know oftentimes I'm guilty of it too. My wife, who's a nurse, is guilty of it too. We often, you know, sometimes before we go to sleep, we're on our phone, right? We're on the right screen, or maybe we're watching a movie or, or something. We're not really setting ourselves up to, to sleep. Uh, and so, you know, oftentimes I think doctors, when they hear someone say, hey, I have trouble sleeping, they try melatonin. Melatonin is relatively safe because it's naturally occurring in our body. Um, and so I think it's important to try to not have to rely on medications. I would believe that, you know, medications and herbal supplements and all that, it's like, you know, they exist, but if you can do without it, that's actually the best that, you, you know, that's the best uh, thing you can possibly do in some sense, because you're not putting any unnecessary things into your body. Now, obviously there's gonna definitely be a time and place when you need to take a medication, right? So for example, if your diabetes is uncontrolled and you have to, you know, you're, and, and you've tried using diet and exercise and it for whatever reason, you're not able to bring your blood sugar down, then of course you have to, you know, it's strongly advised that you take a medication. Because you know, if your blood sugars are going to stay high for a long period of time, that's going to even cause more damage to your body, right? To your kidneys, to your eyesight, to your wounds. Uh, and so I think medications and supplements definitely have a time and place. But if you're able to do without it, then that would be uh, the best thing that I can recommend. And to focus just on nutrition and to get your nutrients from food, because that's how that's how we've existed all for, for so long, right? Vitamins and minerals and medications. Uh, didn't exist, you know, back in the day when we were running around naked and, and being hunters and gatherers. So. Um, then there is a question about um, doctors will prescribe D3, but rarely regularly order testing D3 blood levels. 
high levels have led to dementia per clinical trials. Your opinion? Yeah, so vitamin D, so vitamin D is one of those supplements that I know I mentioned earlier that most people are commonly deficient in. There's not a lot of good sources of vitamin D from food naturally. I mean, uh, fish and mushrooms will have some, uh, or they'll fortify milk with vitamin D or even orange juice with, with vitamin D. Um, I think, uh, you know, as the uh, person had mentioned, you know, maybe high levels, of course, can cause, cause kind of issues. I don't think vitamins uh, necessarily could cause dementia. Maybe it can contribute to uh, dementia uh, symptoms as well. Uh, but that just kind of goes back to what I was saying. You don't want to take something in, in high doses or mega doses or toxic levels. Uh, vitamin D, we, we produce naturally in our body, just like melatonin, right? Vitamin D, we produce, it's known as the sunshine vitamin, right? Uh, even if we were to be not, and I don't advise anyone to go outside naked and soak in the sun or anything like that. But if say we did do that, you know, the most amount of vitamin D our body will probably produce is maybe about 20, 30,000 international units. Most vitamin D supplements are usually about 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 uh, international units. Uh, so as long as you're not going overboard with the vitamin D supplementation, it shouldn't, shouldn't cause an issue. So uh, somebody asked about the role of liquids in a healthy diet and what you specific, what your specific recommendations are. Uh, can you repeat the, you're talking about liquids? Was yes, the, uh, uh, the role of liquids in a healthy diet and yeah. what your specific Yeah, so fl fluid is, uh, you know, water or hydration is definitely very important, right? Uh, not only maintaining our blood volume, you know, but also helping clear, you know, any toxins or salt or, you know, food. Uh, toxins in our body to help our, our kidneys. Um, fluid is one of those things. I know a lot of times people hear like, oh, I need to drink eight glasses of water a day. Uh, this is actually not in fact necessarily true. Eight glasses is probably sufficient for most people. Uh, but, you know, someone who weighs 100 pounds versus someone who weighs 200 pounds of lean muscle, you know, eight cups might not be enough for someone who's 200 pounds of lean muscle and two, uh, eight cups might be too much for someone who, who barely weighs 100 pounds. And so in a hospital setting, or the way I normally calculate fluid needs for people is based on their weights. Uh, and, uh, and if you, to take it a step further is based on their body composition. Um, so chances are, if you don't have any kidney disease uh, or heart disease, like congestive heart failure, or if you haven't been told that you needed to restrict your fluid, uh, then, you know, I think for most people, you know, six to eight cups of water is, is more than adequate. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you definitely don't want to consume uh, too little. Uh, I think for the elderly population, uh, oftentimes dehydration is more of an issue than overhydration, right? Uh, oftentimes as we get older, we lose our thirst mechanism, it decreases in our thirst mechanism. We're not as mobile or moving as much, so we're not losing as much uh, hydration. Um, that's why oftentimes I see a lot of patients in the hospital that ended up there because they were dehydrated. Uh, dehydration can lead to a, what's called an acute kidney injury, basically acute renal failure. So oftentimes there uh, have to be fluid resuscitated, meaning you get IV fluids as a result of that. The next question I think is very interesting because it concerns all of this. So what is the best way to check if you have enough vitamins and minerals in your body and do not need supplements? Yeah, that, those are, that's a great question. So uh, there's, a few, there's definitely a few ways. Um, you can ask your doctor to do tests. So you know, vitamins and minerals, there are lab tests for it. For example, like vitamin D. Uh, they can test your vitamin D level, vitamin A level, your zinc level and whatnot. Um, but I don't advise everyone uh, listening to go to your doctor and all of a sudden say, hey, I want to get tested for that. Because one, getting blood draws is not fun. Uh, and two, it can also be unnecessary. I would say it would be necessary uh, or if you have a hunch, if you, especially if you have symptoms of deficiency. Fortunately, being in the United States, most people don't have any sort of deficiency unless their diet's very restricted, uh, whether it's by choice or religion or financial or whatever the case may be. Um, so I, I would say, 
you know, if, as long as your diet has a variety of food, chances are you're not going to be deficient in any sort of nutrient. And there were quite a few questions about fish oil and if mm. you can recommend fish oil or any specific brand of fish oil. Yeah, I, I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to uh, recommend any specific brand. Uh, I personally actually do take fish oil. Um, just because most, I would say in the United States, most of our diet is pretty low in omega-3 fatty acids. And so I think uh, supplementing, your, supplementing your diet can ha definitely have a potential benefit. Omega-3 fatty acids, we get naturally from food. So it's a relatively safe, um, you know, safe supplement to take. Uh, once again, as far as recommendation goes, look, I, I, use, I only bought purchase products that have the USP seal. Uh, of approval just to make sure that it, it contains the potency and purity of what it can have. Uh, fish oil is also one of those supplements. Uh, it can oftentimes contain a lot of contaminants. So you can imagine fish can contain mercury, right? So when you have a um, supplement, sometimes uh, some of these supplements, if they're not re tightly regulated, uh, can have high, you know, um, doses of mercury that are probably not good, uh, which can be harmful to our body, you know, and our liver and whatnot. Um, so I would say, I, I personally supplement my diet mostly because I don't eat fish three times a week or anything like that. Um, and to just kind of try to round out my diet. Uh, who knows, right? Supp maybe, maybe it doesn't have, uh, maybe it doesn't help me a lot. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it's one of those things. Supplements do cost money. And I'm sure, um, you know, that's, that's one thing I did talk about, but uh, you can imagine supplements can also add up uh, from a financial standpoint, uh, which is why I, I don't necessarily uh, recommend or prescribe supplements, um, but rather try to promote uh, eating your, your food naturally, because that's, that's the best way, right? It's, uh, you have to remember when a, you have food changed to a supplement, there's a lot of in between, right? The processing part. Uh, which can introduce contaminants and, and issues. And so rather than take that risk, uh, why not focus on, on trying to eat? Yeah, talking about what you just said uh, about, you know, eating and that this is more important in the end, you know, there's actually a recommendation for a book and it's called How Not to Die, Discover the Food Scientifically Proven to Prevent and Reverse Disease. And it's actually seems by a Dr. Michael Krieger and Gene Stone. Are you familiar with it? Uh, uh, that one, I am not. Uh -huh. no. But I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, I let, uh, you mentioned the title or you mentioned, you described it being scientifically proven, you know, coming mm -hmm. from a physician. Um, I think, you know, those are, those are promising, you know, those are good things or promising things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and it's, yeah, it is, yeah, it is all science with more than 130 pages of footnotes. So yeah. Um, obviously, yeah. And then there was another book uh, recommended, um, a new scientific approach to hydration, the book Quench by another doctor, Dana Cohen and anthropologist Gina Brea, who studied why people in the most arid areas of the planet like the Kalahari Desert are better hydrated than most people in the industrialized world. So that sounds kind of like provocative and interesting. Um, yeah, I hear maybe that, maybe we can, I don't know, how, how many more questions are you willing to answer? Um, I hear about many people taking probiotics. Uh, what's your take on this one? Yeah, so probiotics, there's definitely been a lot more science on our, uh, our gastrointestinal health, right? Um, you know, for, uh, for a long time, we didn't kind of realize how important our, our gut is. And so probiotics have definitely, um, you know, we can get it naturally. I, I've, you know, probiotics are occur naturally in a lot of foods. Uh, for example, yogurt or kefir in uh, Asian cultures, you have uh, kimchi, uh, you have sauerkraut, right? And so probiotic, you know, kombucha, which has been uh, definitely trending the past decade or so, so I would say probiotics are probably best consumed uh, more so in the natural state, um, but you can also get it in a pill form. There's definitely no harm in taking probiotics. It's one of those things that's either going to help you or it's not going to really do anything. Uh, so pro probiotics are definitely uh, important. Uh, oftentimes 
in the hospital, they're recommended mostly for people that have a lot of uh, gastrointestinal issues like diarrhea, uh, which can be secondary to taking antibiotics, right? So if you're taking antibiotics, you can think about how that's not only treating the infection, but it can also cause a disruption in your gut health, right? It, could, it can oftentimes kill like the good bacteria that's in your health. And so probiotics are often rec uh, recommended to kind of help replenish your, your, um, your gastrointestinal health. All in all, there were a lot of questions about, or comments actually more about uh, vitamin D and there is here, there is one for your information to share. The clinical trials on D3 have come from Sweden where there is so little sun a large part of the year and almost everyone is prescribed uh, vitamin D. The normal range from Sweden is 25 to 35. Kaiser goes up to 75 milligram and does not allow regular testing. There are other problems from overdosing on supplemental D3. So your comment about that? Have you heard about this? I mean, yeah, I've, I've heard of uh, d uh, dosing issues or toxicity issues, um, so oftentimes too from the manufacturer. So uh, kind of going back to this, the regulation of it, uh, if, if it says it's, let's say 10, uh, you know, a thousand international units, uh, sometimes a company might have, you know, for whatever reason, it en en ends up being not the correct dosing. Um, you're saying uh, it was a, in Sweden, was it? I'm trying to find the Yeah, question. it was in Sweden, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I, let me see. Ah, it, okay. Yeah, it was, um, did you find it? It's 25 to 35. Oh, yes. The normal yeah. range. And Kaiser okay. goes up to 75, you know, so. Yeah. I think it's one of those things that the testing, I, I can't speak for Kaiser, even though I'm a Kaiser employee, uh, but it's one of those things over, over testing is not necessarily going to provide any sort of uh, benefit, right? Uh, vitamin D is, is, is a, what's called a fat soluble vitamin. So we, it's, it's not something that uh, increases, uh, let me see how I could phrase this. It's, it's not necessarily something that uh, depletes uh, necessarily quickly. We, we kind of store, you know, fat soluble vitamins uh, in our in our liver and, and, and whatnot. So testing it every week is just going to cost be costly uh, and also uh, uncomfortable uh, getting constant blood draws. Um, what I advocate for my patients and what I would recommend to uh, those who are watching, if you are wanting to make sure your vitamin D levels are uh, normal, uh, is definitely ask your doc, you know, your primary care physician, I'm almost 100% certain would be okay with you checking it, uh, you know, once a year, maybe twice a year, but it's not something that needs to be checked uh, constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you're already supplementing your diet, it's, it's one of those things. Uh, sometimes over testing can, can, be, uh, can be harmful, rather, you know, it would provide no benefit and also costly. Um, still uh, willing to answer one question. Uh, sure, we'll take one last question. Yeah. yeah, and this is actually, I think, a really good one because sure. uh, it helps everybody. Um, are, are, are pharmacists a good source for supplement information? Yeah, pharmacists are trained uh, primarily in drugs, uh, but they do, are, they, they should also be familiar with uh, supplements as well. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, it's a big industry. So, you know, every day, every minute, there's always going to be, uh, there's going to be some sort of new supplement out there. And it's one of those things, the, I think the science or the research and studies on it, it it's, it's kind of reverse, right? It comes out, but there hasn't been a lot of research on it. And so that's where, uh, when I kind of jokingly said, like, you definitely don't want to take a supplement unless a lot of your friends have been taking it for a while. And, and, that's, and, and that's why, right? Because you want to make sure that it's safe. It's not going to cause harm. Uh, pharmacists, you know, I think as healthcare workers, we all try to stay on top of it, but it's, it's one of those things that's changing. It's evolving. There's so many uh, different, different things. There, it's, a, it's almost impossible to know um, all the different supplements out there. But I would say your doctor, your pharmacist, your dietitian, doing your own research, subscribing to consumer labs or uh, looking for the USP seal of, of approval, or all those things are going to hopefully 
in combination help determine, uh, help you make that decision whether it's uh, something is safe or if it's not, or whether you want to take the risk of it or not. Uh, and with that being said, I personally, as a dietitian, I advocate for food as your source of nutrition. Food has been around forever. Supplements have not, right? So food has been around forever and we know eating food is gonna be good for us, especially certain foods, uh, then why not try to get your nutrition from food as opposed to relying on a supplement? And, and as I mentioned before, uh, supplements, medications obviously have their time and place, but if you're able to do without it, that's gonna be better for you in some sense in, in the long run. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for answering all these questions. They were very interesting. And I mean, your presentation was great. And um, so, um, yeah, it's really interesting and thought provoking. So um, yeah, back to Jeanette. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Solomon, for all this really valuable information. And thank you, Kaiser Permanente, for another Embracing Change event. Um, for, and for all of you out there, just one more little commercial. If you've enjoyed the presentation, we hope that you'll consider a tax deductible contribution to Ashby Village. Uh, you can do so now using the link in the chat box or on our website. And we thank you for that. And then I want to just take a, a minute to tell you quickly some, um, some, some events that are on the calendar in the future for healthier aging. Uh, in August 10th, we have Elder Action and Member Support presenting Nursing Homes, What's Wrong and How Do We Make Them Better? And that'll be at, at 10.30, it's a Zoom uh, presentation. And also um, August 17th at 10.30, there's a presentation of the My Nurse Pilot Program, which will provide services and support to members and chronic conditions such as um, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. We will be one of four uh, villages in the country chosen to pilot this program, which, which is managing chronic health conditions at home, and it's funded by Medicare. Um, we also just want to let you know on the calendar, there are nature walks, which we're doing twice a month, and they're on the calendar for August 9th and 25th, and September 13th and 22nd. And then finally, uh, not on the calendar yet, but save the date for a dementia presentation on October the 21st, and that'll be at 2 p.m. And that's all I've got. Suyin, do you have anything 